Let me pray for us, and uh, we'll start our time together. Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to gather with your people, even as the world sings your praises in ways they do not understand. Uh, we gather with joy to sing those same words and mean them from the heart, and only because you have caused us to, to be born by your spirit, to be born from above, to be given a new voice, new thoughts, um, to be new creatures, to sing your praises. And if rebellious humanity did not sing your praises, surely the rocks would cry out. And so we, with joy, gather together under your word, singing the truths from your word, encouraging one another with the things from your word, uh, because you have made us able and alive. We ask this morning as we look at eternal rewards for temporal obediences, that you would be glorified, that this doctrine in our Bibles would have your intended effect in our lives. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Am I better to go with this, this, are we okay? We're good, you're great. All right, uh, we're beginning a three-part series this morning on the biblical doctrine of rewards. And we're talking about eternal rewards for temporal obediences, things we do in pleasing the Lord here in this life are awarded treasures in heaven in varying degrees. Just as there are varying degrees of punishment in hell, so there are varying degrees of enjoyment and capacities for service called rewards in your Bible in heaven. And this is a much neglected doctrine. Although it's found all over our Bibles and is immensely practical, I want to suggest a few reasons why this doctrine gets neglected. I think, first of all, we tend to be short-sighted. We think in terms of how do I manage this week's challenges rather than how do I invest in eternity. And I want to turn your attention to Matthew chapter 6. This from Jesus' lips in the Sermon on the Mount, verses 19 to 21, just to get our hearts thinking along these lines. Follow along with me as I read this. Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but, command, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And the reality that Jesus wants us to know is there is something to live for beyond this week's challenges. There is a place to store up treasures beyond this week's problem solving or simply surviving day to day. Perhaps the second reason why this doctrine is neglected is it may seem selfish to pile up for yourself anything. <laughs> to pile up for yourselves treasures in heaven seems like some sort of greedy, self-absorbed enterprise. And yet these commands are here. We'll need to deal with that. A third reason these, this doctrine is neglected is just simply the question, what are these treasures? What are these rewards? Are we talking about piles of cash or gold coins? I mean, in a place where the streets are made of pure gold, what good uh, is a pile of gold coins? What, what are these treasures? And perhaps because we don't know the details of what these treasures entail, we are less apt to heed the encouragements to store them up. And then I think the biggest challenge for us and the reason perhaps that in environments where the gospel of God's grace, that salvation comes by grace alone through faith alone, produces in us, in our circles, a neglect of the doctrine of biblical rewards is it seems perhaps that a doctrine of rewards goes against or works against a doctrine of salvation by God's free grace. Have you ever felt this way, that if grace is unmerited, if the only way that anyone gets to heaven is by not earning, not doing good works, then some biblical message about doing good works and being rewarded seems to run counter to the gospel itself. 
Is that true? Both of these realities are in our Bibles, and can they sit next to each other and be friends? <laughs> That's the question we need to wrestle with. And the goal in all of this is to be able to affirm and believe and be moved by the things the Bible actually says about rewards. God has written these things for our benefit. So what I wanna do in this short series is address this neglected and important biblical doctrine. I wanna answer some of the questions that we may have about eternal rewards, and mostly I want to rekindle an eternal perspective that we might live lives that glorify God here on the earth, motivated by the promises of God concerning our own best interest. And I'm convinced that if we could only catch a glimpse of the reality of reward in heaven, dispensed by God for temporal obediences here, our lives would radically change. Think about it. If there was something you could do right now that would please God, by which he would offer you an eternal reward, whatever that thing is, Surely, if we had a glimpse of eternity and could look back on this life, we would say, every effort was worth it. <laughs> what would you give in exchange for such rewards? You know, you should have bought Apple stock in July of 1985 at six cents a share. Or maybe in April 2004 at 41 cents a share. You could even have purchased Apple stock in April of 2020 at just under $60 a share. It was traded Friday afternoon at $171 a share. <laughs> and of course, looking back, you would think, I wish I would have, I should have. Or, you know, we think about time machines and lottery tickets or betting on baseball games, World Series, past. If, if I had a time machine, I'd check out those lottery numbers. If I had a time machine, I'd bet on baseball games. But way better than cheating at gambling or clairvoyance at stock trading is a, li is a life of simple faith yielded in obedience to God for the production of spiritual fruit which gets rewarded in moth-proof, rust-proof, theft-proof reward for all of eternity. And you can bank on the promises of God related to the doctrine of eternal rewards. So here's what we're gonna do uh, in this series, beginning this morning, we'll get as far as we can this morning. Number one, we're gonna listen to a handful of the many passages that mention eternal rewards. We're just gonna start to listen to the Bible's testimony to this doctrine. Secondly, we're gonna consider the character of God. We're gonna work our way through some, not all of, but some of God's attributes. And I think this is gonna be helpful for us because if we contemplate who God is and then reflect on who we are, we will get a right sense of what we deserve and what we get instead in the grace of God. This is gonna help set a foundation for a doctrine of reward. And then thirdly, we'll tackle the question, does a doctrine of rewards work against the doctrine of salvation by unmerited grace? Fourthly, we will examine in more detail some key rewards passages. And then finally, we'll develop a summary of the doctrine of rewards by pulling together all of the data, all the information that we have from all of the relevant passages. So let's begin just by listening to a few of the biblical passages on rewards. I'll begin in Genesis 15, and, and you can just listen. You know, this is Genesis 15, one. Do not fear Abram. I am a shield to you, says Yahweh. Your reward will be very great. Jeremiah 17, 10. I, Yahweh, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Matthew 5, 12. You're blessed when you're persecuted, therefore rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In Matthew chapter 6, when you pray, you're not supposed to pray in front of everybody so everybody sees. When you give to the poor, you're not supposed to give to the poor in front of everybody so everybody sees. If you give and pray and fast in front of people, you have your reward. It's done. But if you do those things in secret, and your heavenly Father sees what is done in secret, He will reward you.
Matthew 25, 21. Jesus giving a parable about a master and slave says to one, well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Matthew 25, 29, for to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. In Luke, 11, or Luke 19, Jesus is telling a parable. He says, he said to him, well done, good slave, because you've been faithful in a very little thing, you are to be in authority over 10 cities. The second came saying, your mina master has made five minas, and he said to him also, you are to be over five cities. You see there a variation in rewards. Romans 10, 12 says, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. 1 Corinthians 3, 8 tells us, he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his labor. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. 1 Peter chapter 1 tells us we obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and reserved in heaven for us. And Revelation 21.7 tells us he who overcomes will inherit these things. I will be his God and he will be my son. There are many more passages to deal with and, and as we put all these passages together, we'll develop a theology of rewards in the Bible and sometimes, so that you know, the, the reward is simply eternal life and everybody gets the same reward, it's eternal life. And yet there are other places where the rewards are varying in their degrees, varying in their value and we'll look at what the Bible has to say about all of these things. What we're going to do here for the bulk of our time this morning is the second part of the outline I gave you. We looked at a few passages, or listened to them rather, and now we're going to consider the character of God. And by taking a little bit of a detour uh, around some of God's attributes, we're going to consider what God is like and by contrast, what we deserve. And so I think this will be helpful for us in setting a foundation for thinking through the biblical doctrine of rewards. When we think about the attributes of God, we're talking about God's characteristics. They are answers to the question, what is God like? This is something true of God. And I recognize there is a danger in isolating and, and pulling apart God's attributes to sort of look at them one by one. It's impossible for us to talk of God and his totality all at once. Language doesn't permit. Time all the way into eternity would not permit such things. And so even though there is a risk in misapprehending God by pulling apart his attributes and isolating them and talking about them one by one, the Bible does this. And so it's gonna be helpful for us to think about these a little bit. God in himself is always all of his attributes. They are of his nature. For instance, God is love. He is always love, even when he is furious at sin. Why? Because God's love is always holy. His is a holy love. That is a transcendent, set-apart kind of love that belongs to no one else. He has no peers in the kind of love he has, but also set apart from sin and its moral purity. God's love is always a holy love. And God always hates sin, even when he is merciful towards sinners. And you understand the equation there when we come to the reality of the gospel itself. Every sin gets punished, whether in the sinner for all of eternity or in Christ the substitute at the cross. God always hates sin. Because he is good, he could do no other. And yet he can be merciful simultaneously. Consider for a moment if God were omnipotent but not wise, if God had power over everything and had absolute sway and his word was absolute command but he didn't know what he was doing. That would be terrible news for all of the universe. So when we talk about God's attributes, we're asserting those things the Bible says are true characteristics of God that are true all the time of him, they flow out of his nature and they all sit together in his being. This morning, we will look at just a few of those attributes, and I believe that thinking about God biblically will help us get the doctrine of rewards more accurately. So we'll talk just about a few of those. Let's begin by thinking about, for a moment, God's goodness. 
God's goodness. God is good. And we have to be careful projecting our own definitions and perspectives of good onto what we think God is or must be like. Wayne Grudem says, the goodness of God means that God is the final standard of good and all that God is and does is worthy of approval. And worthy of whose approval, you might ask? Well, everyone's. Everyone ought to approve of God as the standard of what is good. What is good? That which God approves, very simply. That which flows out of God, that which God says is good, that is good. We begin with God himself, God is good. In Luke 18, 19, Jesus said, why do you call me good? To a man who assumed Jesus was a mere man. He said, God alone is good. And Jesus is right, he's not denying his deity, he's just smoking out the man's low view of Jesus. And Jesus there affirms that only God is good. There's a sense of the goodness, when we talk about goodness, that belongs purely and solely to God as the source and definition of all good. Psalm 100 verse five says, Yahweh is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 34 eight says, O taste and see that Yahweh is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Not only is God good in and of himself, but what God does is good. We remember back to creation, Genesis 131, God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good. Psalm 119.68 affirms, you are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. And everything that is good in the universe comes from God, James 1.17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. If there is something good, it comes from him. Acts 14, 17, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And that goodness dispensed to the believing and unbelieving alike. Matthew 5, 45, you may be sons of your father who is in heaven for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. God dispensing undeserved kindness goodness on those who have not earned it. And God's goodness is expressed in particular to the redeemed. Romans 8, 28, you know this well, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. That is a different kind of good, a specialized kind of good that is over and above that which is promised to the world of unbelievers. Listen to Matthew 7, 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? There's a great indictment of humanity's view of some sort of relative goodness. You know, I helped a little old lady across the street. How could you say I'm guilty of total depravity? <laughs> um, Jesus affirms that a father who gives his son bread, not a stone or a snake, does a good thing. But the one doing that, Jesus says, is evil. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts, and it's an argument from the lesser to the greater, from the baddest to the goodest, if you, being evil, know how to give a good gift to your kid, how much more does your father give good gifts to his children when they ask? God is good, and he does good. Hebrews 12.10 they, that is earthly parents, disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but God disciplines us, his children, for our good so that we may share in his holiness. Discipline from the Lord is good. Listen to Paul's perspective on the thorn in the flesh. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. A good result in the hands of a good God. Uh, even very difficult things. We know that God's goodness is expressed to the unredeemed. God expresses his own love, undeserved kindness, 
even though angry with the wicked every day, expresses unmerited favor and common grace to them, rains and seasons and sun and good things. When we think about the goodness of God, we might be tempted to ask the question, could God be gooder? Is there, is there room for improvement in God? Is there room for improvement in what God does? And see, the answers to those questions, of course, are no, absolutely not. God cannot be better than he is. God could not do better than he has done. But think about what kinds of situations tempt us to ask those questions. What does this tendency say about our theology and our own hearts when, when something isn't going the way we would like it? We tend to doubt the goodness of God and his being or his purpose. We think about how God's goodness ought to be reflected in those who belong to him and are called by his name. One last thought, Psalm 84, 11, on the goodness of God. He says, no good thing does God withhold from those who walk uprightly. It's a great promise. The implication in that is, if it's not in my life and I belong to him, then it's not good for me right now. God has not seen fit to put something in my life that I might deem as good. God has not deemed as good. By the way, this is not a performance measure standard verse. No good thing does God withhold from those who walk uprightly. I must, I must need to walk a little bit more uprightly if I want that Lamborghini Countach because it's so good. <laughs> no, the, those who walk uprightly is a categorical statement of God-fearers, those who are in a right relationship to God. It is not a performance standard of, well, today I didn't walk as uprightly as I should have, so God's withholding good because he's stingy. That's not the reality. God loves his children and he promises good to them. And he's not stingy and he does not withhold. So if there's something that I have determined as good for me right now that God has not determined so, my definition, my description needs to conform to his. Rather than complaint against God's absolute goodness and the goodness of his plan. Let's think for a moment about another attribute of God, God's righteousness. And we would couple this with justice. The word group, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, for righteousness and justice really is just one word. It's unfortunate in English that those have been divided out. We think of them as two separate categories sometimes. But think about the word justification is to be declared right. It might be righteousification, um, a legal declaration of righteousness. Uh, and that's true both in Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament. One word, we think about righteousness, justice, God does what is right because he is right. God does what is just because he is just. And when God puts forth someone as just by his declaration in heaven, who could condemn? Right? That, that's the word group we're talking about. In Deuteronomy 32, 4, the rock, his work is perfect. All his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. And you think about faithfulness in a context of God's immovable justice, faithfulness here means that which keeps with God's righteousness. God is faithful to uphold his own reputation as right and just. He doesn't swerve from these things. Genesis 18, 5, far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? The human perspective there wasn't all that it needed to be, but the affirmation that the judge of all the earth would do justly is right on. John 17, 1725, Jesus calls his father righteous father. Righteous father. And, and all of this talk of God's justice and righteousness necessitates punishment for sin. It necessitates Hell, the doctrine of endless punishment, for if there is not repentance, if there is not righteousness in the place of sin, and if God is always righteous, the eternality of hell is appropriate. This demand for righteousness and justice from the very being of God also necessitates the cross and the cross work of Christ if there is to be any salvation of sinners. 
Right? How does God keep his own reputation as just and right and good and beautiful and always faithful to those realities and sinners go free? There is no other way except the cross of Jesus Christ. Romans 3.25, God displayed Jesus publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. That is a satisfaction of divine wrath by a substitute. Jesus in our place absorbs and removes all of God's right and just anger against sin. And he propitiates or assuages the wrath of God in his own blood through faith, through our believing that that is what satisfy God's wrath. And this was to demonstrate God's righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed, the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that God would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. If God is to be right and just, then in, even in the way he forgives sins, he's going to put his own righteousness, his own justice on display. He will be just and the justifier. That is, justice will have its due course. His wrath will go against sin until infinite wrath is completely done being wrathful. The only way that can happen is if an infinite being is absorbing the infinite quantity of infinite wrath which is why Jesus has to be God. If he's not God, there's no forgiveness of sin. There's no assuaging of wrath. It's the only way God can be just and the justifier. That is the one who declares righteous the unrighteous. The guilty go free because the guilt was transferred and punished in its entirety. And if you have another way to heaven besides the cross, you do not have a just God. If you have some other way than Jesus, you can't take care of sins. And if God lets sinners into heaven, he himself is not holy. I mean, the, the whole thing falls apart. If, if heaven is going to be good and beautiful and a place with no tears and no sorrow and no curse and no sin, then sinners must be forgiven and their sins removed. And the only way God does that without ruining his reputation as righteous and just is at the cross. What is the standard, by the way, for righteousness to, to which God conforms? Is righteousness this thing up there and God every day wakes up and says, Am, have I met it? Am I there? <laughs> no, of course not. The standard is him. He is the standard of righteousness, of justice. You can look up Romans 9 and Job 38 to 40 on that account. Let's talk about wrath for a moment. God's wrath is part of the complex of his attributes, and as such, it is holy wrath, it is good wrath, it is beautiful wrath, it is part of his love. Now, what does it mean for God to love purely? It means for him to love all that is pure, which the converse of which means to hate that which is impure. God's wrath is the holy, good, beautiful, outflow of his love, goodness, brilliance, purity in the presence of sin. Because God intensely loves all that conforms to his own goodness and righteousness, he also intensely hates all that is not good and righteous. God's wrath is the inevitable response of God's goodness to sin. Exodus 32, 9 and 10, Yahweh said to Moses, I've seen this people, behold, they are an obstinate people, let me alone that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them, and I'll make of you a great nation. God was rightly angry at an idolatrous and obstinate people. John 3, 36, Jesus says, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Romans 1.18 makes clear the present reality of God's wrath abiding over the world of unbelief. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is being displayed as an answer to the question, why do we need the righteousness of God? We need the righteousness of God, Romans 1.17, because wrath is abiding and wrath is coming. How do we get the righteousness of God? Back up to Romans 1.16. It's found in the gospel and only in the gospel. Back up to Romans 1.15. That's why Paul's not ashamed. 
Wrath is coming. You need righteousness. It's in the gospel. Therefore, I'm not ashamed to proclaim the gospel to you. Ephesians 2, 3, describing the human condition. We lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 speaks of the wrath to come. Jesus, God's Son, comes from heaven. We wait for His return, the one whom God raised from the dead, who rescues us from the coming wrath. And Second Peter says, the Lord is not slow about His promise, His promise to punish sin, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Look, you go to the Grand Canyon, and you might be tempted to say, wow, that big hole in the ground is so beautiful. What you should say is those layers of rocks are all there on display because God hated sin and buried the world in a flood. And next time it's by fire. <laughs> next time you go to the Grand Canyon, you can put that plaque on the side of the canyon wall. That'll be great. What would God be like and what would the universe be like if God did not hate sin, if he did not hate injustice, if he did not hate unrighteousness, if he did not ha hate evil? The universe would be awful. And what should our attitude be towards sin, injustice, unrighteousness, and evil? And we should hate it. And, 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 and we should hate it me first. <laughs> right? John Bradford used to say when seeing some sinner in the gutter passing by, he'd say, ah, but for the grace of God, there goes John Bradford. Right? It ought to provoke in us a compassion, a sympathy, uh, an expression of their pitiable estate in need of the gospel ought to make us proclaimers of the gospel when we see sin and evil. But it's not the only response we ought to have, is it? We ought to have in us some capacity to hate what God hates. And, and I'm convinced that will be perfected in eternity. In fact, if you think about Revelation 19, you, you have a scene where Babylon, the anti-God, satanically driven, world-ensconced system, faces judgment. The smoke of her torment rises forever and the world laments. They exchanged gifts when prophets against that system were killed. And then they weep when her ships don't go back and forth, bringing merchandise. And yet the saints in heaven, the concentric circles of worshipers around the throne, the, the four living creatures and the angels, and particularly the tribulation martyrs in that scene, they rejoice and they say, how long, O Lord, till you avenge our blood on our enemies? And then when Babylon is destroyed, they sing a song. They say, hallelujah, just and righteous are your ways, O Lord, because you have punished the great harlot. Just take comfort in this, Christian. If we weep here over sinners now, God will wipe away every tear and we will echo the sentiments of heaven then in ways we cannot now, should not now. But know that, that our hearts will resonate with a heavenly perfected perspective on evil that in some ways is mixed now. Jesus himself, when he was here, said, how I have longed for you, Jerusalem. Jerusalem to protect you as a mother hen protects her baby chicks. Jesus said of the rich young ruler who went away in unrepentance that he felt a love for him. There's a sense in which we hate sin and we are sinners and we hate it in us and we are to hate sin outside of us as far as possible without hypocrisy and be patient with others, and lament the condition, and express mercy and compassion. Now, let's talk about mercy and compassion in God for a moment. Mercy, grace, patience, these are all attributes that are bound up in the very nature of God, the very character of God, have always into eternity past been there, but find their expression in the presence of sinners. These are ways in which God relates to people who sin. Mercy, grace, 
patience. They, they would not be seen apart from sin. And they're all seen as expressions of God's goodness, but particularly in the presence of sinners to whom God seeks to bestow unmerited favor. Mercy is God's goodness toward those in misery and distress. It is a word that means to have pity on someone in a pitiable state. Mercy, compassion. We might think of mercy as not getting what you deserve. You're in a sorry state, perhaps uh, much of your own making, and when it comes to sin, really all of our own making, and we don't get what we deserve when God is merciful. When we talk about grace, that is perhaps the more positive side of the coin. It is God's expressed goodness toward those who deserve only punishment. If mercy is not getting what you do deserve, grace is getting what you absolutely don't deserve. Unmerited favor, loving kindness. You could think of grace by the acronym G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. It's a great way to think about grace. It, it's free in the sense that God, in his own being and purpose, freely dispenses it to people who don't deserve. He's not obligated. But it's not free in terms of its cost. It is infinitely costly for God to be gracious to sinners, particularly in the realm of salvation that comes at the infinite cost of the death of his own beloved son in our place the righteous in the place of the unrighteous, to bring us to God. Patience is God's goodness in withholding punishment toward those who sin over a period of time. That is Grudem's definition. God withholding punishment toward those who sin over a period of time. God is patient. Listen to Exodus 34, 6. Yahweh passed by in front and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. Psalm 103.8, Yahweh is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. 2 Corinthians 1.3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. 1 Peter 5.10, after you've suffered for a while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. He will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And Romans 2.4, do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? When we think about God's kindness, when you think about his, particularly his kindness to sinners in their pitiable state, his mercy, his grace, his patience, is God obligated to express these things? Does God have to be gracious and merciful? Well, it's a trick question. No, not in the sense that he would be obligated by anything outside of himself. But, but yes, in the sense that he is obligated by his own purpose and plan and nature. God does what flows out of his nature according to his perfect purposes from all of eternity. And God will be faithful to those things. Let's talk about the love of God. And these things are inexhaustible, you know this. We, we can't give an introduction to the scratching of the surface of a snowflake on the tip of an iceberg. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. God is love. When we talk about God is love, you, you don't reverse that equation. Everything that's love is God. That's the world's perspective. But God himself is love. And, and this has duration to it that goes on forever and ever and ever into eternity future. It also possesses duration into eternity past. And a number of equipping hour segments ago, uh, we talked about the relationship of God's love for God in inner Trinitarian expression being the foundation for God's love for man. God the Father loves the Son, God the Son loves the Spirit, God the Spirit loves the Father and the Son, and they work together in selfless expressions of love one for another in inner Trinitarian relationship that goes all the way back into eternity past before there ever was a universe, and that is the foundation from which God loves 
man. And we love God because he first loved us and we love one another because of that love for God in the heart. The really remarkable thing when you think about love, when you, if you truly love another person, it has foundation on top of foundation on top of foundation. It all begins with God's love for God in perfect intertrinitarian relationship flowing out into God's love for man and man's love for God and man's love for man. Here's the love of God for us, 1 John 4.10. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Don't you love the initiation of God's love? We were dead in transgressions and sins, unable, unlovely, had no desire to love God. And God started the process with us. When we were at our worst, he didn't wait for us to clean ourselves up, to get things figured out, to get one intellectual step ahead of the next guy. But God loved us when we were at our worst. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And John three sixteen, God so loved the world. Uh, don't think BBC big, beautiful, blue marble seen from the moon. Isn't it lovely? No, uh, think the way John used the word world so often, the anti-God system opposed to him in enmity, driven by Satan, the God of this world. Uh, God loved the big and bad world of humanity. What did his love produce? A giving of his only begotten son. Don't think Christmas present with a cute little bow on it. Think incarnation unto Death, substitutionary sacrifice, bloody death on the cross. So that all the ones believing in him will absolutely not perish but have eternal life. That's God's love. It initiates, selflessly gives, and secures unto his purposes. Galatians 2.20, this gets personal for Paul. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Do you say that? Do Do you know the love of God? Is it personalized for you? God loved me. There is a sense, of course, in which God's love is expressed to unbelievers. Psalm 5.5 indicates God hates and is angry with the wicked every day, and yet his wrath is postponed. He's patient. He enjoins us who follow him to love our enemies, and in so doing, we will be like him. But the Bible makes it clear that God's unique love for his people in Christ is never-ending, inexhaustible, unbreakable. Let's talk about another attribute of God, the glory of God. And and if we follow Edwards here, Jonathan Edwards would say the glory of God is the outshining radiance of the sum total of all of his attributes. In other words, it's everything that God is in himself shining out in brilliance. And the Old Testament word for glory is a word that means heaviness or significance, weightiness. New Testament word for glory is the word for brilliant, effusive light. And both of these things capture the reality of what God's glory is. And we talk about God's intrinsic glory. That is the glory that God has all in himself. He doesn't need anything. He is independent of his creation. Uh, He is the one from whom all glory radiates out. And yet the Bible also talks about giving God glory. How do you give something to someone who has everything? You're already asking that question because you got just a couple weeks left to Christmas. How do we give glory to God if God himself is intrinsically glorious and glory is the outshining radiance of the sum total of his attributes? He doesn't need me. He didn't do anything in redemptive history because he was lonely or needy, dependent. We ascribe glory to God. We recognize that that which is intrinsically true. We applaud, We, we, we... Recognize God's fame. That's what it means to ascribe glory. 
God's intrinsic glory is to be reflected and ascribed back to him. And then God also dispenses glory. He glorifies his saints. That is, we get to share in his glory, not in that which is his peerlessly, but perhaps something like a lamp and mirrors. We get to be in his glorious presence and there are other reflectors of his glory that redound to greater glory to who he is. Romans 11.36 says, From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. All intrinsic glory is his. All ascribed glory goes to him. And again, we're not looking at an exhaustive list of his attributes, but we're building towards thinking about a biblical doctrine of rewards. Let's think about one more attribute. That is the fountainhood of God the fountainhood of God. Um, We we might talk about the self-giving nature of God, the overflowing reality of who God is. And if you read Jonathan Edwards, The End for Which God Created the World, you you understand the the philosophical case that is to be made for why God made everything. And fundamentally, biblically, it is simply because God is glorious and in his purposes wanted his glorious self to be shared, to be known, to be enjoyed, to be worshipped. And the interesting byproduct of that is the creatures who would be created for that end and with the fall of man and sin would be redeemed unto that end, forgiven unto that end, purified unto that end, glorified unto that end, into God's presence for that very end, get all the benefit. (laughs) It's all for our good. God's desire to give of himself to a redeemed people for their infinitely increasing joy for all of eternity is God's fountainhood. Consider his attributes and the ways he's desired to express and reveal these to us. God is, by nature, incomprehensible. To finite minds, he is incomprehensible. And yet, God has made himself knowable. He is transcendent. That is, he is above and beyond the universe, above and beyond everything that is created, and yet he has made himself imminent, that is, near. He is independent, As a creator of all things and sustainer of all things, he is independent of all things. He is self-existent and not needy. And yet he has entered into love relationships with creatures. And God has this essential glory, and yet he is glorifiable, and he gives glory to others. Listen to this invitation, Isaiah 55. Yo, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. Now, this invitation is the invitation of the Bible. It is the promise of the Bible. Listen to John 7, 37. Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come and drink. Same invitation. In Revelation 21, 6, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. This free gift of God to the sinner who will listen, come to God and get everything. John 17, 3, this is eternal life, Jesus says, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. This is the self-giving nature of God, culminating in eternity, culminating in what it means for heaven to be heaven. We get to know him. Ultimately, he is the treasure. He is the reward. And this leads us to a discussion about rewards in the New Testament. Do we obligate God by anything we do? Is somehow a doctrine of rewards like a business transaction? I'll scratch God's back if he scratches mine. God's in need of something and somehow, you know, he's petitioned us and then incentivized us to go do these things, to pick up these little trinkets and doodads that he doesn't have in heaven with him. And if we can just bring them with us, then his collection will be complete. And, you know, he's got to pay us off at the end and give us our due rewards. Is that what biblical rewards are? No, we're dealing 
with the God who is an infinite fountain who gives and gives and gives and gives and gives. From him, through him, and to him are all things. Can we produce something that God does not have that will be of some benefit to him? Will God reward something that he himself does not produce? Ephesians 2.10 is clear. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works in which we walk. But who's the producer of these things? Who's the the one who lives out the Christian life in Galatians 2.20 for the Apostle Paul? It is Christ in him. Who is the one who produces spiritual fruit? It is the Holy Spirit who produces fruit in the life of a believer. And we're getting towards the bottom line on the doctrine of rewards here before we've even opened those texts. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we won't walk through an exposition of it this morning. That is for next time. But having just traced through The reality that there are rewards of varying degrees, we've heard some of those texts. And we've contemplated for a moment who God is, and by contrast, who we are and what we deserve. I think we're in a good place to hear this explanation of the Bema seat judgment. That is, that judgment seat of rewards for life lived in the church in this age. A life yielded in faithful obedience to God producing fruit which God rewards. Paul says, what is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants, through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. (coughs) If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire." This is a judgment for believers. Believers are the only ones in view here. Their labors for eternal things, the building on the foundation, which this building described here is the church, the expansion of the gospel through God's people to the ends of the earth during the church age. And how people build is critical. The materials they use are critical. And we come to this scene and we discover that God rewards activities in this life, temporal obediences, yield in faith and the service of God and his church. And you show up to heaven to the God with whom you have no business as a sinner. Now declared righteous, adopted, a citizen, a son, a daughter, an inheritor. And you've been given Everything, you would, you would trade everything to have this one reward called eternal life and yet there is this bema seat judgment and you show up and God recounts the things you've done and some of those things, well, they all go through the incinerator. Some of them come out the other end. I used to be terrified of this passage. I don't know about you. Oh, all those things I did, they're, they're all gonna get burned up. The longer I live, and and, and the more I'm aware of wood, hay, straw, chaff, stubble, garbage. It doesn't belong cluttering streets of gold. What a kindness of the Lord to run my life through the incinerator and dispense with all the chaff. 
I got all this stuff. I, ho I hope it makes it into heaven. Wait, uh, this doesn't belong here. God, could you, could you take care of that? And he does. The fire removes all the worthless stuff. And what comes out the other end? Precious things. Sustainable things. Eternity worthy things. Where did those come from? Don't you just, don't, don't you understand? We, we won't be there lamenting the chaff. If there is lament, it, it would be loss of opportunity. Why didn't I invest in Apple at six cents a share? You know, the, I don't know if we're, we'll have those thoughts, but we ought to have those thoughts now. That's the point. And what will we say on the other end when there are treasures that have been laid up in varying degrees based on temporal obediences? God, the, the stuff you're rewarding, you, that's the stuff you produced. That's the stuff you made. That's right, God rewards only what he produces. And we will say, what a God who gives and gives and gives again to the undeserving. We'll talk in the coming weeks how this relates to the doctrine of grace, how this relates to sin and declarations of no condemnation. Uh, we'll talk about what the import of this is for the way we live our lives in the coming weeks. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you. We will forever thank you, and it will never be enough to express gratitude for you, for your goodness, for all that you are in your holiness and justice and wrath and beauty, for your mercy to sinners, your patience and your grace. Thank you for sending your son whom you love, whom you crushed in the place of transgressors to bring us to yourself. You are our treasure. You are our reward to know you. And God, we pray to long, even as you have commanded us to long for greater capacity to serve you and to enjoy you into eternity by yielding our lives in faith to you even now, step by step in secret ways the world would not know to obey you, to store up treasures in heaven, Again, that all things would be from you and through you and to you forever. Amen.